Um, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Rebecca Bowling. She's an assistant professor and extension specialist with the Texas A&M AgriLife. She's an urban water specialist um, and specializes in appropriate plant selection, soil management to improve soil infil infiltration and water use in residential and commercial landscapes alike. It sounds like she has all the information we need um, for today. So uh, thank you for joining us this morning, Dr. Bowling, and I'll let you take it over and we'll enter your questions in the Q&A panel and we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. Okay, great. Thanks, Jennifer. So uh, thank you guys for being here this morning. I'm excited to be here. This is my first time speaking at this event and probably my first time speaking in front of many of you, uh, unless you've been tuning in. I've been uh, working a lot with the Water University group uh, over the summer and spring, and I've done a few of their classes. So you may have seen me there. Um, I am excited to speak on this topic. Uh, before I moved up here to Dallas and I, I switched roles to doing urban water, I actually served as our statewide extension turf grass specialist for two years. So uh, turf best management practices are something that I've become very uh, uh, familiar with. And, um, you know, this is just always a great, a great subject. So, all right, I'm ready to get started. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, when we're thinking about this today, and we're talking about twice a week watering um, and that being enough for North Texas, and I know we have people joining today from other parts of the state. Um, I saw Bob Daly from the Woodlands, so hello. So um, when we're talking about it being enough, we're referring to kind of two big things. So I'm sorry, Jonathan, I've got animation, so I'm going to have you click once here. We're talking about both quantity and having sufficient quantity with twice a week watering. And then you're gonna click twice. And we're also talking about sufficient frequency, okay? So we're gonna kind of talk about those two things in relation to turf grass management and health. Please advance. So first of all, when we're talking about quantity, um, you can go ahead and click and There we go, perfect, okay. So it's important to remember that while rainfall varies from year to year, uh, a lot of times historic data shows that we receive enough rainfall during various parts of the year that we really only need supplemental irrigation during this critical season, which tends to be uh, most often between about June and September. Uh, May can vary. A lot of times we get quite a bit of rainfall in May, which may be sufficient to meet the needs of our turf grass system. So this is a, a, a chart that I put together with data from the Texas ET network. Uh, and the yellow column represents average rainfall that we may receive here in the Metroplex, uh, and the green column is going to represent average watering requirement. And this is calculated from reference evapotranspiration and a warm season turf grass crop coefficient of 0.6, okay? So we can see that most often as we go through the year, our rainfall is sufficient to meet the need of our watering requirement. And furthermore, in many parts of the state, our turf grass, our warm season turf grasses, are really not actively growing between about the months of November and February, maybe even March. Now, if you're in a particularly southern part of the state, you may stay green or you may continue to grow um, during some of these colder months. But many of us slow down growth, so this dramatically decreases the need for water in our turf grass systems. And so, you know, one of the things that we really want to encourage is that people are just turning off their water altogether uh, during these months. And then when we do have supplemental irrigation on, we're primarily focused on, we're going to click, sorry. <laughs> We're primarily focused again on these months where you can see the average watering requirement tends to exceed the average annual rainfall that we receive. And of course, again, we can have variability from year to year uh, where we have a particularly wet summer or particularly dry summer. Um, but typically this is what we're focused on. And we'll click. 
Awesome. So um, typically, you know, if we take some of this historic data and we focus just on these four months where uh, the need for water tends to exceed the average precipitation that we get, uh, and we look at the average reference ET and the average watering requirement on a weekly basis, uh, we'll see that it never exceeds an inch per week, particularly here in North Texas. Now, if you are watching from El Paso, you'll see that it looks a little bit different uh, where you are compared to here. Um, so most of the time, even when we are not receiving any rainfall at all, uh, we don't need to put out more than one inch of water per week in our turf grass areas. Uh, and most of the time, it ends up being closer to about half an inch, uh, particularly here in North Texas. And so this is easily achieved through one to two waterings per week. Advance. All right, so this is the first thing that we really want to communicate to people is that, you know, we are more than capable of meeting the quantity demand that's required for our turf grass system with a one to two time per week watering schedule. Um, in order to put out that, that 0.5 to one inch. Now, a lot of times this requires that we have some kind of source, uh, some education source on how to teach people to determine the precipitation rate for their irrigation system in order to put out this known uh, quantity of water. And um, so that, you know, introducing them to resources on catch can auditing and things like that um, so that they know exactly how to run that system to put that amount out. Next slide. So one thing that I wanted to introduce you guys to today is the fact that uh, there is a lot of research, of course, that's being done on uh, improving water efficiency in turf grass systems. Um, there's definitely a lot of awareness that turf grass areas end up uh, taking a lot of water and end up being a, a big source of uh, irrigation inputs in urban landscapes. And so there's a lot of effort, even in the turf grass arena, um, to improve water use efficiency in, in new species. And one of those projects is one that I'm on with the USDA. Uh, and uh, it involves these five institutions, and we've actually also included uh, University of California for this newest round that we're on. And the intention of this research is really to work with the turf grass breeding programs at each of these major universities, which are responsible for the development of new turf grass cultivars for the urban landscape, uh, in order to identify uh, new varieties that have improved water use efficiency and are going to perform better uh, in drought susceptible landscapes. Next slide. So we actually have two locations here in Texas where we're looking at this. We do have a turf grass breeding program uh, here at the Dallas Center uh, with Texas A&M and our turf grass breeder there. Her primary focus is on improving water use efficiency and drought tolerance and turf grasses. Uh, she's primarily working with St. Augustine and Zoysia grass. Um, and we also have a research location in College Station, of course, on the Texas A&M campus. Uh, and we've been doing some research over the past several years where we have uh, several new lines of turf grasses that are kind of in development, uh, along with a few commercial standards. So things like Celebration Bermuda, Palisade Zoysia, Floritam St. Augustine. And we're evaluating the performance of those grasses under different watering regimes in order to determine how they perform uh, under regimes that are typically uh, um, outlined by municipal ordinances. So we've got uh, two times per week is the most that we water. Uh, then we also have a one time per week, uh, twice per month, once per month, and then we also have plots that are unirrigated. Uh, a lot of this data is going to be published here within the next year or so, and so we'll have that available. Um, what I can tell you from a lot of our work is that most, most of the time we don't see a significant difference in turf quality and appearance, um, depending on, you know, whether we do once per week watering or twice per week watering. So this really shows us that we don't need to be out there watering every day, and we don't even necessarily need to water twice per week in some cases um, to maintain healthy turf grass lawn areas, particularly once they're established. Next slide. Now there is kind of a, a catch to this, and we'll, we'll get into that here in a second, but 
Um, you know, one thing that I really want to emphasize today is this is this idea of twice per week watering. A lot of times, uh, homeowners may view this as a hindrance. They may view it as a limitation. But actually, in the big world of turf, this is considered a best management practice that we um, recommend deep and infrequent watering practices to promote deep root growth and development, okay? If we go out and we water very frequently and very shallow, shallowly, uh, it ends up creating uh, what I like to call a little codependent turf baby, right? So it knows that you're gonna be out there every day putting that water on and watering that upper two inches of soil. And so it's really never motivated to develop roots deeper into the soil profile. Um, whereas if we choose to water deeply and infrequently, uh, what we end up doing is, let's say that I go out and I irrigate and I wet the upper six inches of soil. If I allow enough time between waterings for the upper layers of the soil profile to begin to dry down, it essentially motivates those roots to reach for the water that's still there deeper in the soil profile. Um, so it really encourages that grass to become more independent and more tolerant of drier conditions over time. And this is something that we really, really want to encourage. And so, you know, when we're talking to the public about this and educating the public on this, uh, we, we really want to uh, emphasize that this is a BMP. This is a practice that's designed to boost the overall health of their turf grass system. And in fact, one of the ways that we see uh, people most often hurt their turf grass areas is through over love from over watering and over fertilization. Um, so teaching people to find that balance, scale back on their watering practices and encourage deeper, more vigorous root growth in their turf system um, can significantly improve the way that that turf grass performs not only under conditions of drought but also over winter months and it also improves its resilience uh, in the face of various stresses like traffic, disease, uh, weeds, etc. Next slide. And so um, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'll try to be quick here, but um, you know, most of the grasses that we have in development right now, these improved varieties, some, an example of one would be Tiff Tuff. Maybe you guys have heard of this. Um, a lot of them get their superpower from drought avoidance. Uh, and this is the idea that their drought performance is really contingent on the depth and, and uh, and the development of their root system. And so um, if we really want people to have healthy, uh, successful landscapes and lawns with uh, reduced watering practices, we really have to encourage that they take steps to improve root systems. Uh, and they Im involve management practices that encourage deep root development and also encourage good infiltration to support that deep watering. Next slide. Uh, some of you guys may be familiar and some of you may be watching with some of the research that was done in San Antonio many years ago by SAWS and Texas A&M, um, which really looked at this more closely. And uh, in this particular study, they evaluated uh, a number of different warm season turf grass varieties, uh, Bermuda grasses, Zoysia grasses, St. Augustine grasses. Uh, and they had two primary treatments that they imposed, one being that they restricted root development to about a four inch depth, uh, and the other being that roots were allowed to develop uh, with unlimited depth. And then they subjected these turf grasses to about a 60 day drought. Uh, and they found that in, uh, in the case of these grasses that had restricted uh, area for root growth, um, we saw that these grasses were not able to survive this 60 day drought. In the case where grasses were encouraged to develop deeper roots and did not have any restricted root growth, they were able to survive. Now they do sometimes go into what we call summer dormancy. Uh, this is the idea that, you know, if we do go through a prolonged 30, 60 day drought, these grasses may go off color. Uh, uh, my colleague, Daniel Cunningham likes to call it going blonde for summer, right? And so, um, you know, reminding people that if we do happen to go through an especially rough drought, drought uh, that it's okay if their turf grass uh, goes blonde, uh, as long as they've done everything they can to encourage that deep root development in the interim when we do have sufficient water. Next slide. <clears throat> so the last thing that I really want to talk about today is just 
When we do roll out municipal ordinances and we encourage that people reduce their watering practices um, in order for us to get really good public buy-in and for people to have a positive experience with this type of management practice, we want to paint a complete picture in which we offer them uh, other practices that they can pair with this deep and infrequent irrigation to bolster the overall health of their turf and really allow this to be a successful practice that they implement. So the first thing that we want to encourage is um, Jonathan, if you'll just go ahead and you, you'll probably want to click a few times here. I can just kind of roll my hand up if you want. There we go. First thing we want to encourage is appropriate turf grass selection, making sure that people choose the right variety and species for their particular landscape, encouraging that people program their irrigation systems to cycle and soak. This helps to improve infiltration rates, reduce runoff, helps to facilitate deeper watering, which supports deeper root development. We want to ensure that people take steps to properly prepare the soil. A lot of times during uh, new development in urban areas, um, this kind of gets overlooked and then people are at a disadvantage on the front end because they're dealing with compacted nutrient poor soils that are not sufficient to support healthy turf growth. Um, so taking steps to incorporate compost and prepare the soil properly and then maintain it well over time. Uh, the utilization of rainwater, of course, uh, this helps us overcome, uh, not only does it help us conserve water, but it helps us overcome a common limitation in the landscape, which is uh, poor water quality and the way that water quality can uh, degrade the structure of our soil and affect the health of our turf. We also want to make sure that we take steps to ameliorate soil compaction as it comes up, um, understanding appropriate practices for doing this and when to do them, including uh, aeration practices on an as needed basis for turf grass systems. Maintaining higher mowing heights in order to promote this root to shoot ratio. When we have more vegetation above ground, we're gonna have more vegetation below ground. And this is something that we wanna encourage. We also wanna encourage that people avoid scalping by following the one third rule, removing no more than one third of their total canopy height at any one time. Again, this helps to encourage deep, healthy roots. And then of course we do want to encourage that people have good integrated pest management practices. I can't tell you how often I've seen people shoot themselves in the foot uh, by overusing broad spectrum herbicides in their landscape. And uh, you know, while many of our herbicides may be labeled um, to be used in turf grass systems, uh, a lot of times you know, they tend to be overused or used at inappropriate rates or used at the wrong time. And this can put our turf grass areas at a disadvantage. Uh, even if the, these herbicides don't kill the turf, uh, they may temporarily uh, slow growth. They can, this can make turf grasses uh, more susceptible to disease. And so we wanna encourage that people have a holistic program and that they're using herbicides and other pesticides at a minimum. All right, that's what I've got and I'm ready for some questions now if we've got some. Great, thank you, Dr. Gerbs. This is, uh, uh, we had a comment that uh, that chart at the beginning of your presentation with rainfall versus the water needs was uh, really interesting and is that information available for other parts of the state? Yes, it is. So if you go to the Texas ET network, they do have historic uh, uh, reference evapotranspiration and precipitation data for many parts of the state of Texas that you can use to kind of see what those trends have looked like uh, over the past 30, 40, 50 years. And they also keep that data available in real time as well. So you can kind of see what that uh, watering demand is uh, as in real time. Great. Um, are you aware of any other resources or data or information on efficient watering that can be shared with our customer cities in North Texas? Yeah, so I, um, we do have a, a number of great materials through AgriLife. Um, you can find some on the Water University website. They have some great publications. We also, uh, I have some materials that I produced for the Aggie Turf website, and that's aggieturf.tamu.edu, including I put together a uh, water-wise checklist, very simple, front, back, simple steps to take to improve uh, water efficiency in your turf areas. Great. Um, looks like that's all the questions we have for now. Thank you so much for your great information and presentation. Um, I think we're going to take a small break from our uh, summit right now, and we will uh, start on the dot at 1110. So everyone take a quick break, and we will be back at 1110. Thanks, Thank Dustin. you.